Hi everyone and welcome to our section on science and faith models. So we've talked a little bit or actually a lot about what science is and what religion and faith is and so now we need to figure out how do they relate with each other and it'll probably come as no surprise to you that there's a lot of different opinions out there about what the relationship between science and religion is. Are they totally separate unrelated things that have nothing to do with each other? Are they deeply intertwined and maybe even the same thing, just kind of under different names? Or are they fundamentally incompatible and, um, and in conflict, conflict with each other? There's a lot of different options out there. So we're going to walk our way through some of the different options and, um, and let you figure out for yourself what you think the relationship is. Now to guide us through this is this concept of a model. A model is a representation of something that helps you understand it in some way. For instance, this is a model of Brandon Crawford. He happens to be a nutcracker. This is obviously not literally Brandon Crawford, obviously, but it does show us some things about Brandon Crawford. We know that he is a giant. He's number 35. He has long curly hair, likes to wear those sunglasses. Um, and has arms and legs. So this model tells us something, helps us understand Brandon Crawford, even if it's not the real thing. Now, in this case, when we're talking about a model, a model of the relationship between science and religion is a sort of simplified, fundamental um, description, inner type of interaction that they have. Um, what your model is for the relationship between science and religion depends, depends on a couple of things. It depends on how you define science and how you define religion, and it will guide you on how you respond to new information about either. I put this optical illusion picture here because I think it actually does a really good job of demonstrating why your model of the relationship between science and religion matters. If you look at this picture, um, you might see one of two different things, or you might see both of them kind of at the same time. At sometimes when I look at this, it looks like this is half of a dude's face. He's looking at me straight on. And for some reason, somebody's cut out kind of half one eye and half of his nose and half of his, the rest of his face there. But other times when I look at it, it looks like a profile. It looks like a profile shot um, with his eyes looking kind of forward. And there's his ear with his earring. It's kind of two things at once. And the way that I interpret it determines kind of how I understand what this picture is all about. And that's kind of the way a model works. Your model of how you understand the relationship between science and religion is going to influence how you make sense and interpret uh, claims that each of them make and, um, and what they mean for you personally. So it's really important for you to know what your model of the relationship is. And thankfully, uh, this lovely fellow here, Ian Barber, is here to offer you some options. <laughs> Ian Barber is a famous scholar of religion, and he proposed four different models for how people view the relationship between science and religion. There's the independence model, the conflict model, the dialogue model, and the integration model. We're going to go through them one by one, give you a couple examples, and let you think through which one makes the most sense to you. So first up, we have the independence model. In the independence model, science and religion can be distinguished by the questions which they ask, the domains to which they refer, and the methods which they employ. This basically means that science and religion are just completely separate entities. Science is over there doing, asking its science questions about the physical world and getting science answers, and religion is over there asking its religion questions about the non-physical world and using its religious methods to get religious answers. And they have no interaction or relationship with each other. So this is my little silly little drawing here, science, religion, and this sort of impenetrable barrier between them. Each mode of inquiry, science or religion, is selective and has its limitations. And the whole thing is kind of compartmentalized. And that compartmentalization, wow, that's a hard word to say, is motivated not simply by the desire to avoid unnecessary conflicts, but also the desire to be faithful to the distinctive character of each area of life and thought. So let's not try to kind of squeeze religion into science. Let's let science be science and let religion be religion and they don't need to, you know, they don't need to interact at all. That's kind of what the independence model is looking at, or is viewing how it views things. And an example of the independence model, someone who holds it, is Francisco Ayala here. He's a famous, um, well-known biologist. 
want to say he's at Brown University, but I could be making that up. He says the following, science and religious beliefs need not be in contradiction. If they are properly understood, they cannot be in contradiction because science and religion concern different matters. The scope of science is the world of nature, the reality that is observed directly or indirectly by our senses. Science advances explanations about the natural world, explanations that are accepted or rejected by observation and experiment. Outside the world of nature, however, science has no authority, no statements to make, no business whatsoever taking one position or another. Science has nothing decisive to say about values, whether economic, aesthetic, or moral, nothing to say about the meaning of life or its purpose. So science is over here, religion is over there, never the twain shall meet. That's the independence model. Next up, we have the conflict model. Um, in this, you can see my science and religion spheres colliding and in conflict with each other. This is the idea that science and religion are making rival literal statements about the same domain. That's a fancy way of saying, basically, there's here's a question, science is providing one answer to that question, religion is providing a, a, a different answer to that question, and both answers can't both be right. Either one is right, or the other one is, but they can't both be right. They're looking at the same questions and giving different answers. And that means that a person is going to have to choose between either believing and accepting science or religion. Uh, both sides agree that a person cannot believe in both God and evolu evolution is sort of the, the most classic example of this, that either you accept evolution or you accept God and what the Bible's saying, but there's no middle ground. You can't have both, it's either one or the other. Uh, people who ascribe to the conflict model often use a rhetoric of warfare, that there's a conflict or a debate or, you know, the, the, the battle is on between science or religion, that it's, it's one or the other. Uh, one example of somebody who holds the conflict model is Ken Ham. Ken Ham is the CEO, director, president, not sure what the title is, of Answers in Genesis, a Christian ministry um, around uh, looking at... Um, supporting the ideas of young earth creationism. And this is his bio take, I didn't write this, this is from um, PBS, uh, how they describe Ken Ham. It says, Ken Ham takes the Bible literally. His worldview is based on the assumption that the Bible is the word of God and is infallible. The mission of his Answers in Genesis ministry is to bring reformation by restoring the foundations of our faith which are contained in the book of Genesis. Because for him, evolution represents a threat to the biblical story of creation. He has devoted his life to fighting it. Notice that warfare um, language there, fighting um, and a threat. Um, so this is sort of, you, you either get science or you get Jesus, but not both. So that is the conflict model. Next up, we have the dialogue model. The dialogue model says that science and religion are different fields. They really do have sort of asked different questions and have different methods and that sort of thing, but they do have some overlapping ground. So as opposed to the independence model where science and religion were separate with that wall in between them, here it's like a Venn diagram. This is the science specific stuff. This is the religion specific stuff, but there is some overlap where science and religion can kind of talk to each other. Uh, some things that they have in common uh, might be considering the presuppositions of the scientific enterprise. Remember those four things that we talked about that all scientists have to take for granted to be true in order for science to work. Uh, exploring similarities between the methods of science and those of religion. We talked about how while their methods are um, different, they both rely on reason and, um, and the collection of evidence and also analyzing concepts in one field that are analogous to those in the other. Um, so the idea of Jesus resurrecting from the dead is an impressive, crazy idea because of what we know about biology, that once things are dead, they usually stay dead. So maybe there's sort of something that we can learn about, about the idea of resurrection by, the two of the, by these two fields kind of talking to each other and being in conversation. The dialogue model emphasizes similarities in presuppositions, methods, and concepts, but it still maintains that there is still some stuff that is unique to science and independent of religion or unique to religion and independent of science. So it's the Venn diagram option.
And someone who holds this view is Francis Collins. Francis Collins is the director of the NIH, the National Institutes of Health, which basically means he's the head medical researcher in the whole US and the federal government. He's a, a presidential appointee. Um, and uh, he also was the director of the Human Genome Project, which was the first group of scientists who uh, uh, outlined the entire human genome, which was a really big deal back in 2003, I believe. Anyways, he is also a, um, a very devout Christian, and he has this to say about the relationship between science and faith. Um, and often evolution is sort of the concept where this these topics are most considered, so I think he'll make some reference to that. Francis Collins says, I believe God used the mechanisms of evolution to achieve that goal. And while that may seem to us who are limited by this axis of time as a very long drawn out process, it wasn't long and drawn out to God. And it wasn't random to God. He had the plan all along of how that would turn out. There was no ambiguity about that. So he's talking about um, evolution as a mechanism through which God created, is sort of a, as a concept. He says, evolution may seem to us like a slow, inefficient, and even random process, but to God, who's not limited by space or time, it all came together in the blink of an eye. And for us who have been given the gift of intelligence and the ability to appreciate the wonders of the natural world that he created, to have now learned about this evolutionary creative process is a source of awe and wonder. I find these discoveries are completely compatible with everything I know about God through the scriptures. So see there how he's how he's taking some ideas in science, like the idea of evolution being a slow, inefficient, random process, and connecting that with what we know about God, that God experiences time differently to us and might even have purpose in things that look random. So there's some relationship between the two, and he's certainly not saying, he, he accepts that you can have both evolution and God, so not a warfare model. Um, but he's also um, acknowledging that, um, that science and faith kind of have some, some unique realms to themselves. So that's the dialogue model. And then lastly, we have the integration model. Here, our, instead of our having a Venn diagram where there's some overlap, the two circles are basically completely um, concentric, overlapping with each other. And integration, I admit, is the hardest one to explain, and it does feel fairly similar to dialogue, but think of it as taking the dialogue model that says there's some overlap and just like shoving the two together and making it this entire deep intertwined kind of whole. The idea is that the unique truths of science and religion can be integrated together to form a more complete whole truth. Um, that knowledge in one produces beliefs in the other and vice versa. So I can draw religious beliefs from scientific findings. Oh, science discovered this thing about the natural world, I'm going to use that to sort of figure out what I should believe religiously about God. Or, oh, I believe this thing from what I read in the Bible, therefore there should be scientific evidence to back that up. I'm gonna go look for that evidence. It's kind of this two -way, un unrestricted two-way street between science and religion. An example of this is something called natural theology. Natural theology is based on the idea that we can basically prove God's existence through science, um, that we can use um, empirical evidence and experimentation to provide sort of indisputable evidence that God exists. Uh, someone who holds this view would be Arthur Peacock. Um, and here's a little bit about, he was a, I think he's also a biologist and professor at Oxford. I think I really should look these things up before I push record. Anyways, here's a little bit what he has to say about the integration of science and religion. God is the creator, convening meaning through the patterns of nature. God is the choreographer of an ongoing dance or the composer of a still unfinished symphony. Change is God's radar beam sweeping through the diverse potentialities that are invisibly present in each configuration in the world. Chance is a way of exploring the range of potential forms of matter. Peacock used, also used the idea of top-down causality, with God at the highest level who acts on the world as a, con as a constraint or boundary condition without violating lawful relationships at a lower level. Peacock also uses the whole-part relations by considering God as the all-encompassing all whole for which nat natural organisms are parts. 
hopefully you can see, I think that first chunk was a quote, the last part is sort of a reflection on it. You can see there how, how for Arthur Peacock, science and, and religion and, and theology are kind of intertwined with each other. It's, it, and you often need the use of metaphor, like a choreographer or a composer or radar beams to kind of make sense of how deeply intertwined these two are. So that is our example of integration. So in summary, we have our four models. First is independence, the idea that science and faith ask completely different questions about different parts of life and they use different methods. And there is no conflict between the two because there is no interaction between the two. Uh, the conflict model says that science and faith are incompatible and make competing truth claims. One must, be tr one must choose between either science or faith. You can't have both. The dialogue model says that science and faith have different areas of expertise, but can still inform one another that there's a limited region where they have some interaction and in that, in that limited space, they can be in conversation. Whereas integration says that science and faith are fundamentally intertwined and influ influence each other. Maybe a good way to think about the difference between dialogue and integration is that in dialogue, science and faith are asking questions of each other. Hey, what about this? Have you considered this? What do you make of that? Whereas in the integration model, it's more of a um, like, hey, I know this is true, so you need, so there must be a corresponding truth in your in this other field. There's kind of this like if then relationship between the two instead of this open conversation sort of relationship. Those, those are our four models of, uh, of the relationship between science and religion. And I can tell you right now that there are people within the Christian community who hold all four of these views. There's probably people within the Valley community that hold all four of these views. Uh, and so there isn't necessarily a right answer here. It's about, um, this is a chance for you to think about which one of these makes the most sense with you, kind of resonates and says like, yeah, I think that's the appropriate relationship that these two should have to each other. So probably not surprising, your next journal is to think about those four models of interaction between science and faith and figure out which one you find most compelling or you agree the most with. Um, and why do you think that? And, and then second, give a few examples of specific things you believe or think as a result of your model of science and faith. For instance, um, as the slides implied, if you are uh, a Christian who takes on the conflict model, um, a likely thing that you might believe is that evolution is in, in conflict and contradiction to the Genesis story uh, account of creation. Uh, so that would be an example of something that you think or believe that evolution can't have happened because God created the universe if you believe, um, if you ascribe to the conflict model. You eat that that might might look different for you, but that's just a an example. So give, um, let's say at least two examples of things that you think or believe as a result of your model of science and faith. Have fun.